to Locally Sourced. I'm Armanda Famoletti. Tonight my guest is Glenn Saper. He's an author, a conservationist, and an outdoorsman. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Glenn, you recently did some public service for your town of Putnam Valley. Uh, you chaired the Na Natural Resources Inventory. Tell me what that means and yes. what happened. Well, uh, there is a, in existence the Commission for the Conservation of the Environment, which is a, a town advisory committee committee made up of uh, volunteer citizens. and. That group created a subgroup called the Natural Resources Inventory Working Group. And what we set out to do was to update the maps from the 2007 Town Master Plan and add additional maps so that those people in the planning, uh, planning aspect of our town will have all the information that's available available to them. Mm -hmm. What kind of information? Well, we have uh, over two dozen maps, maps on different aspects of land, whether it's slope, um, use, uses, uh, tax parcels, and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and also water, water resources, drinking water, surface water, vernal pools is a new one that we created. And then we went beyond that to add a couple of new maps uh, that are more cultural. One is historic highlights of the town, historic resources, and another one is scenic resources. So, um, someone approached you, right? How did this all begin? Some other nonprofits, I think, and uh, the DEC? Yes. Tell me from the beginning how this came to be. Well, the uh, actual, the CCC, as we say for short for, the, for our commission, really became active again in the last year and a half. And in the very beginning, really, maybe even before I got involved, Wendy Wetzel, who is a town council person and the liaison to our commission, mm -hmm. to the town board, had been talking with the DEC about developing a natural resources inventory. And uh, she was encouraged to apply for a um, grant. Grant, and Really, the grant, I guess, is administered through the Hudson Highland Land Trust. So it was really a joint effort where a grant was applied for and received and the Hudson Highland Land Trust along with assistance from the DEC's Hudson River Estuary Program all got involved with our little commission to spearhead and develop this, what is now a beautiful document called our Natural Resources Inventory. I think inventory. We, we have the cover of that document. We can show that, um, the cover of the report. So. Uh, so the, you got the grant from the DEC, and it was a pass-through sort of from the Hudson Highlands. Exactly. A, that's a nonprofit. That's correct. And there's the cover. Yep. Um, so uh, what are we looking at in that cover? Well, Is that it, beautiful it, it, places in Putnam Valley? It depicts a few of the uh, aspects of what the natural resources of Putnam Valley are and what they can provide as far as recreation goes. Oh, okay. So, uh, recreation, but I assume also um, you want to make sure that the rivers stay clean and the groundwater exactly. is, is that, okay. I mean, that's, and that's, that's, that's the point. That's uh, the point, right? And, but, uh, you know, I'm awed by the talents of, the, of our volunteers on the committee who did a lot more of the maps than I did. But the one that I was involved with was conserved in public lands, comma, recreation. And it was fascinating for me to update and explore what public lands are available uh, for recreational mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uses. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of that in Putnam Valley. So um, uh, there's going to be a public hearing, right? right on, on and people 13th. are in Putnam Valley, and I assume anyone else who wants to find out more about the natural resources inventory can go to the, that public hearing. We have a slide. Um, if we can get there, it is. Um, on March 13th at 6 p.m. Where, where is that? That's the only thing missing from that slide. This will be at the Town Hall, which is on Oscawana Lake Road. I don't remember the street number, but it's, it's right near the intersection of Church Road and, okay. and Oscawana Lake Road. Okay. And I'm not sure that was up long enough for people to read it, but it said that people could come and make, and make comments, and there'll be a presentation right. um, uh, about um, how this came to be, sort of like what you're telling us. Right. Uh, tonight, um, so so we you 
there's a video that I saw, and I tried to find it again online. I couldn't. I went to the Putnam Valley Town website, but I didn't see the video. Um, it was your group presenting at a town board meeting. Yes. And it was very interesting, and there were these huge, beautiful, colored maps of the different aspects of the inventory that you made. Yes. And uh, uh, we've got a couple. We've got a, a picture of a map, so it's on the monitor now. It's yes. such a huge map that you really can't make out much of that. But that's, that's the, just the historic map, yes. right? Yes. You know, the, as, as I said, we have more than two dozen maps. but And they're all as beautiful as this? They, they are. And huge. It's incredible. <laughs> and they're all um, in a digital system where they can actually be overlaid, which can help planners as they mm -hmm. take into consideration various aspects of the resources of the town when considering development, proposed mm -hmm. development. So can you, um, with this digital system, I assume it's some kind of mapping program right, that was used, um, can you put all the maps together? Yes, you so could. So you can have one map with all the information yes. on it. Wow, that's great. Um, so let me see that map, the, uh, the top half of that map. Maybe we can see a little better. And this, these are just historic sites. Right. Um, and let's see the bottom of that map now, too, because that's the top half of Putnam Valley, and that's the bottom half. So you can see the topography as well, right? Right. right. Um, yeah. When you were mapping out the historic sites, did anybody find one that no one knew about before? You know, I, I, I can't answer that question. I'm not sure. But there were two people involved. Uh, I know Wendy Wetzel was kind of the lead in the historic resources, and she went throughout the town. She worked with Sally Cipher, who at one time or another had oh, been... Well, I've had, had Sally been, on the show. Yeah, well, you know that she was the county historian and, and our town historian as well. So with her assistance, um, they, they mapped out most of the historical resources. It's kind of interesting because all they of the maps are complete. They left out a few. Complete. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what I'm saying is that, <laughs> that, that the historical resources map, there are actually two versions, one for the town planners that will know about every historical resource in the town that we were able to map, and then others that we felt were sensitive and perhaps didn't want to have the public going to see because of the possibility of vandalism. Ooh. So it, there are two versions of the historic yeah, map. So there's a secret treasure map <laughs> that's of historic the only one. places. <laughs> well, that's, maybe you shouldn't have said that, Glenn. It's kind of on the QT. But anyways, um, so there we have another sample map, and that was of, the of scenic, scenic resources. resources. So there's that map. Yes. Um, and looks like there are lots of scenic resources. Well, in and we Putnam identified Valley. them. We identified them in the most democratic way we did of all of the maps, because we actually held two public sessions with a big map of, of the town. In fact, we had a few of them made up, so we had different tables where people could come around mm -hmm. and identify their favorite scenic areas. And we identified both the scenic viewing spot and the view itself and made sure that they were publicly accessible. Okay. And uh, we also... Very democratic. Yes, we actually placed the, the map also on line with the help of the Hudson Highland Lands Trust and people could go online and designate their favorite scenic areas. So we really got a lot of public input that way. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. Um, so let me see the top part of the scenic map. Um, and I guess everywhere we see a star, that's a point exactly. that's a scenic. Exactly. And all of those stars are publicly accessible. Yes. And there's the bottom half of the map. So looking at this map, I'm going to say Putnam Valley is, is extremely scenic. <laughs> well, we think so. I, I suspect <laughs> that's why most of us live there. And all Now, were there any hidden scenic places that you don't want the public to really go and see? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, so there's no s secret scenic map? No, because if there are any secrets, I don't think people would have revealed them. <laughs> Let us put them on okay, the map. Okay, so they're really <laughs> favorite, favorite scenic place yeah. they probably didn't even yeah. talk about because they want to keep it for themselves. Right, maybe there are some secrets out there that we <laughs> haven't mapped. So, and you said that, I think I asked before, did, did you find anything new? I mean, in all the different mapping that you did, which you said there were 12 different maps, so 12 different we no, have scenic, we many, have historic, many more than we 12. have... There are over two dozen maps. So scenic, historic, what are the other maps? Well, I hate to pull out notes, but this is, 
the table well, of contents. More so, than a dozen. And, so. and I can just tell you that we have geology and topography, bedrock geology, steep slopes, streams and watersheds under water resources. One of the new ones was vernal pools. You know, these are the bodies of water that disappear in the in the summer, but uh -huh. are there in the, in the spring. Um, That's where the peepers are. Exactly, it breeds it breeds life. Uh, whether it's it's frogs or salamanders or or other insects and and creatures, uh, and now we've mapped that out as well with the help of infrared uh, mapping tools. Wow. It's just it, it's incredible the technology that was brought into this, and we. Citizens can't take credit for that, but the mapping company that we worked with was able to pull in all of the resources that are currently available and inc incorporate them into our maps. Okay, so the working group, I I get the picture of these volunteers. How many of them were there all together? There were about a, a half a dozen Six. of us. Six people did this. And you went out to every corner of Putnam Valley and you had some kind of a, a camera or a list or how did you... How did you do this? It must in, have been very systematic. In some cases, it wasn't a matter of going afield, but just finding all of the information that's currently available and then pooling our knowledge. Uh, in other cases, with the historical map, for instance, it was a matter of going out to these different places and getting coordinates. The same thing with some of the water and land mm -hmm. maps, where we, j we actually went afield and what we needed to do was communicate the coordinates to the cartographer, and then he was able to make it happen on on paper. Okay, so did you have special equipment for this, or no, just take no. measures? It's our telephones and GPS oh, and that wow. kind of thing. Oh, okay. So you did have a lot of technical help, it sounds like, and who provided that? Well, it was all through the grant, but Chasen is the name of the company, the engineering company that that did the original mapping for the master plan in 2007, okay. and we used an excellent cartographer there to, rec okay. to create the new maps. And how much did all this cost? You know, I don't know the dollars and cents, and I never did know that. I, I'm curious to know what's left in the grant, because we'd like to have a party to celebrate. <laughs> To, how, to well, how large was success. the grant? I, I honestly don't know. It, it's not dollars and cents that ever ca came up. We just, really? um, I think that the Hudson Highland Land Trust and their representative, Karen Doyle, who really was excellent at spearheading our whole project and keeping us on track, she was the dollars and cents person. And if there was a problem, we would have been told about it if we were going okay. beyond the budget. But so I honestly don't know what the grant was. I, if the grant was granted before I got involved, uh, and and I never heard it, I do know what our next meeting. Yeah, and that would have been my first question, <laughs> Glenn. But we we did what we had to do, and it came within budget. And uh, one of the things on the agenda for our next meeting and last meeting, which I created, is how much money's left. <laughs> okay. So, but the important thing is that the taxpayers of Putnam Valley didn't pay for any of this. Exactly. Right. right. No matter what the exactly cost was. Right. So that's really important because. I would think that every town in New York would want to have a natural resources inventory. So like if Carmel wanted to do it, how, how would we do that? Who do we contact? I, I would suggest that the, they contact the Region 3 office of the DEC to get started okay. and, um, and go from there because the people that we worked with were from the DEC um, to help us get started and to give mm -hmm. us the major guidance, uh, okay. people primarily with the Hudson River Estuary program of the DEC. Okay, so we, the taxpayers of New York, pay for the DEC, and so I guess, yeah, and the <laughs> in grant. a way, our tax money did go to fund this, but not just uh, Putnam Valley taxpayers. Exactly. Okay, um, so do you think it was worthwhile? Well, that remains to be seen. I certainly think that it was worthwhile. The, to know that we've put together all the available information and created more information that wasn't available and got these on maps in a modern system where the maps can be overlaid and so on and be able to provide not only the public but most importantly the, the people that make the important decisions mm -hmm. in our town as to what development takes place right. and will is, have that at their disposal. Is that going to include the Putnam County legislators? You know we... Uh, Putnam Valley sort of is, is sort of in the middle of Putnam, right? And whatever goes on there affects all uh, the county. The information will be av available to everybody. So um, whoever 
would find need for it, we'll be able to uh, use them. And, and even though the hearing on the 13th will be to formally adopt it, in the last month we've sent out the NRI with a, a link to the NRI to not only all of our town officials, but to county officials as well, including the okay. county planning department, wanting them to know what we've done, wanting them to review it and make any comments and corrections if they saw any. Right. And so far it's all been good. You don't happen to have know that URL off the top of your head, do you? It, it's about, I think it's about 25 characters. Uh, uh, so no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what about going to the Putnam Valley Town to the, website? Would you yes. be able to find information there? I, I would there? think you can, and certainly after the March 13th meeting, it's going to be made public. Okay. That's terrific. And you don't have to be a Putnam Valley resident to go to that meeting. Right. Will all of the maps be there? Um, I don't think we're going to have copies of all of the maps. We'll probably have copies of some just to give people an idea of, of what's... Okay. Because wh the actual maps are like the They're size big. of of our thing here that's well, why we had them made that large so that people would be able to see them you got to put them, them on display cuz they're beautiful yeah. and there's so much great information there um, so i'm going to just sort of uh, shift gears sure i mentioned at the beginning of the show that you are not just a public servant and a volunteer but you're also an outdoorsman an author and a conservationist Right. So, and you recently, after a career, a, I guess you made your career writing about the out of doors. Right. You've put your favorite articles together yes, in one book that you've edited, and we've got a, a picture of that book. I think it's leather band. It looks yes, it, it looks is. very fancy Leather-y. there, Glenn. Well, very thank nice. you. Although that makes it look sort of like a slim volume, and the book is actually how many pages? Yeah, it's uh, 480 pages. Wow. <laughs> Are there photographs or no? Um, there are not photographs. It's it's no illustrations. It's just my words, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> now, what drove you to, to to do this? It sounds like a Herculean task. Well, my career has has been fifty years long. It's included being an editor for all of the major outdoor magazines, what they call the big three, and working for a couple of others. Twenty seven years as the outdoor contributor to what, the journal news. What, the big news. three? So that's Russia, the United <laughs> States, and China. Well, that's, that's impressive. Outdoorsmen think of it more important, more important terms. Field and stream, outdoor life, and sports of field magazine. Oh, that big three. <laughs> that okay. big three. I, all right. So I was an editor with them. And in fact, the first person to actually serve on all three mass heads. And uh, as I said, I wrote the outdoor column for the journal news for 27 years. I've Contributed to dozens of Are you still writing the outdoor column? No, that ended about a year and a half ago, and soon thereafter, having learned of my availability, New York Outdoor News, which in my opinion is the, is the best and most comprehensive outdoor publication in the state, um, invited me to be a columnist, so I do oh, do one for them now. That's your only column that you're writing now? Um, plus some freelance articles. I, I retired from full-time work about four and a half years ago, and one of the reasons I did so was to be able to write what I wanted to write about for whomever I wanted okay, to write so about. Okay, so you were assigned to go go to uh, Canada or some other beautiful sporting place. Uh, Somebody had to do it. Yeah, it was, sounds like a really tough life. But, <laughs> you know, you, you hung in there and you did it. Um, so it's not just about New York that you're um, an expert outdoorsman. You're, it's the whole world. I've, af I've actually traveled um, for, as destinations to 48 of the 50 states. And next month I'm going to Hawaii, so that only leaves Ohio. I'll figure out a oh. reason to go there. You're going to write about Ohio. I, um, I mean, absolutely. Hawaii. <laughs> That's a big difference. I write about almost everywhere I go. And, uh, <laughs> and it gives, well, I just love to explore the outdoors wherever I go and then communicate the stories. So you, you've written, how many, how many stories are in the book? How many articles? Uh, it, it was supposed to be, you've talked about how big the book is. Um, it was supposed to be about half that size, and I wanted to, I, I really created the book as a legacy for my children and grandchildren and family and those who would be interested in reading about it. I ordered 500 copies. I didn't want to go to a publisher. I wanted complete control over it. And I guess my vanity got in the way. So as I went through all of the stories that I'd written, uh, it wound up with with about 168 stories. Wow, okay. Um, twice as many probably as I originally envisioned. 
And, and probably, I would guess offhand, half to three quarters are locally based, uh, Putnam County and Hudson Valley and New York State. But I traveled huh. to the Arctic um, to fish for Arctic char and I've traveled to the Amazon Basin to fish for peacock bass. And I have stories about that and oh, many wow. of my other travels. That's, that's amazing. So, but most of it is about locally, New yes, York State. Yes, a lot of it, yes. Um, so I know it sounds to me like you had a hard time finding, you know, the favorite stories. There were so many. But could do you have like one or two you could kind of share um, and why they were I, so I important can. to you? I can. And it's interesting, you know, I've kind of gone from writer to promoter since I put this book together um, because I'd like to sell enough of the copies to at least make up for the expense. Oh, right. that, your, that, your family isn't big enough? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But um, so this past weekend, for instance, I spoke both at the Putnam Valley Library and the Mayapack Library and did a book signing there. And at the Mayapack Library, somebody asked me about my favorite destination. And, and I started thinking about it. It didn't take me too long to come up with it, but it's the same answer that I'd give you as my favorite story. And yet, when I think about the destinations, I've stayed in five-star resorts in my pursuit of the outdoors, and yet this was in a tent camp in eastern Montana. Mm. And, and the story is kind of briefly that an editor that I worked with um, very closely when I was at Field and, as, as an editor at Field and Stream, I worked with a field editor, a writer by the name of Norm Strong, who had moved from Long Island to Montana to go to college and never, and never came home. And I would work with Norm over the telephone in developing stories, and I'd see him every year at the Outdoor Writers Association of America's annual conference. We became good friends, and every time I'd see him or every time I'd talk to him, he'd say, when are you going to come out and hunt or fish with me in Montana? And I'd say, someday. And one year, Norm didn't come to the OWA conference, and I was told that he had a hernia, and that prevented him. Well, that hernia that I heard about in June turned out to be a malignant tumor, mm -hmm. and by October, Norm was dead. And I grieved for him and his wife. And when I stopped grieving for them, I realized that there were other relationships, like the one I had with Norm, that I wasn't going to let slip away. And uh, I called up a friend with a similar, similar relationship and said, we're going hunting this fall. I don't know where or f I don't care where or for what. You plan it, but I want to be with you for a week. And we wound up hunting mule deer in eastern Montana in a tent camp that looked like MASH uh, headquarters. Oh, yeah. I and, assume this is the summer months. So, um, uh, no, okay. actually, we, we hunted in, I think it was November. Mm. And uh, we, we, we did fine. And uh, just spending time with this friend for a week and do, sharing the outdoors, uh, I wound up calling the story, Don't Let Someday Slip Away. And uh, I'd say that's my favorite story mm -hmm. in the book. Yeah, so it isn't just like where's the best place to fish and what's the best gear to use, and it's really personal stories that. Somebody, you can, uh, somebody who who bought and read the book said that that my humanity came through in the book, and I'd like to think that's what the book is about. Uh, it, it isn't the how. I didn't choose the how to, and where to stories that I've written for this book. One of them, the one that I can think of that I did include is how to take children fishing. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> because it, 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 you have to be educated. You can't just go out and expect to fish and expect your kid to fish and expect to have a good time. Right. Well, don't you spend most of the time on the snags? Exactly. Yeah. You've so been there. So you really there. need to undo the snags. It sounds yeah. like you've been there. I, I, I'm, I'm the creator of the snags, <laughs> actually, and my husband undoes them. So. Right. Um, and speaking of my husband, who's an avid fisherman in these parts, we moved up here because of the beautiful reservoirs and brooks and streams. I have to ask you, where's the best place in Putnam to fish? Well, I, I've always tried to avoid naming places no, in no, my no. stories. No, 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 you have to name them now. Because, but I'll tell you that Putnam County is responsible for me becoming an outdoors person. Even though the first 11 years of my life were spent in Stuyvesant Town in Manhattan, and, and the next years through high school were in Yonkers, my family always had a summer place in Putnam County in Putnam Valley. And for most of those years, it was a little summer home 
off of Pico Hollow Road where Pico Hollow Brook ran around the community. And that's where I learned to fish. It's where I grew up in the outdoors, and it's where I still love to fish. And I won't, I won't pinpoint any areas, but that's the trout fishing so spot. I, I, so you don't want to say it publicly, but after the show, you'll tell me exactly where it is, right? Well, we'll talk about it. And you'll show it to me on the map, right? <laughs> Come on, Glenn. That's just not me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing with fishermen. They keep it all to themselves. It, You're a very close-mouthed bunch. If I can tell you a very brief story... One of, the first have a minute. Uh, one of the first trips I made for Field and Stream was to a place in Nevada where I didn't see any other fishermen except for those in my group. And um, I was told by the Fish and Game Department that, this, that the areas could, use the, could withstand pressure from fishermen. I wrote a story called Trout Full and People Empty. It came out in May, and I received a letter from the campground administrator in the campground next to the reservoir I wrote about, wrote about, and he told me that on Memorial Day weekend they had to turn away a thousand people from the campground. And okay. I have to presume it's because of the story I wrote. Okay. So I learned very early in my career not to name places. Uh, okay. All righty. Well, I appreciate that then, and we will talk after the show, <laughs> and it's just me. Um, I won't tell anyone what you okay. tell me, uh, but I do want to thank you for the work you've done for Putnam Valley and getting everybody together to do that uh, natural resources inventory. And I hope it gets lots of publicity and I hope all the towns in, in Putnam Valley, I mean in Putnam County, go out there and get a natural resource inventory. Thanks so much for coming on Thank the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for sharing your stories with you us. And thanks to the crew who comes out so faithfully and to the viewers who watch.